Hello everyone. Welcome to our series two of latest in IVF in the European meeting last month. Uh, in fact, in July, uh, didrogestone in FET, frozen embryo transfer. So today we are going to discuss the role of this molecule in frozen embryo transfers, which was discussed in this conference, which is held every year and it's one of the largest conference in IVF where the whole world gets together to collate their data and to share their experiences. This time this was in uh, Amsterdam, which all of us know is such a beautiful city and we also gained a lot of experience. So today's uh, paper, which I liked and I want to discuss is uh, programmed ovulatory frozen thawed embryo transfer, POFET, a suggested FET protocol integrating aspects of embryo transfer scheduling, efficacy optimization, and maternal fetal safety. So just in this line, it's really loaded with terms. So what? let me just explain it to you. What is this programmed ovulatory frozen thawed embryo transfer cycle? So as we know, we have fresh embryo transfer and frozen embryo transfer. And frozen embryo transfer can be done in cycles where you, when the period starts, you just give estrogens and roughly around the 15th day or 18th day you transfer or you give uh, wait for a natural cycle, you see the ovulation and then you transfer. So this is a programmed ovulatory means it is ovulation but you are adding something. It's a natural cycle with something else in it. It's a frozen embryo cycle and when you can transfer how efficacious it is and is it safe for the baby? Is it safe for the mother? Now, this paper was given by Dr. Tanja Eggersman. She is a scientist, a doctor working in Lübeck, Germany. And she has presented this concept, which we will discuss today. So uh, what is very important to understand is that in what is the luteal phase? Uh, so this is, if we give this molecule, which is didrogesterone, how will it, will it increase our success rate? And so when should we give it? Now, just to recap our natural menstrual cycle. So what happens? Your periods have started then your E2 estradiol level increases because your follicle is increasing. And then the follicle, uh, there is ovulation. So the estrogen goes down and the corpus luteum is formed and the progesterone rises. So post ovulation in the next three to five days is when we do the transfer. Because it is in the ovulation, then naturally what is happening? Egg is released, sperm is meeting in the tube, embryo is forming, it is traveling back to the uterus, it is sticking in the uterus, it is growing into a blastocyst. All this happens from ovulation to five to six days of the ovulation. And in this time, this hormone progesterone is very important. So this is a natural cycle. There was a corpus luteum and you have progesterone. But in a frozen embryo cycle, when you're giving estrogens from day one, day two, or you are down-regulating, giving Lupron injections before the period starts, your uh, body is not making the corpus luteum. So after the transfer or just before the transfer, you have to add the progesterone and only then will the baby uh, embryo develop because there is no natural corpus luteum. So this progesterone, which is either secreted by the ovaries, post ovulation or natural artificially you are giving, it supports the corpus luteum, it is 
secretory transformation, uh, which means that if this is your follicular phase and this is the luteal phase, in the luteal phase, the endometrium undergoes certain changes, which is called secretory transformation. And that is done by the progesterone. It is also an immune regulator. So not only does it, uh, you know, help in the pregnancy uh, or the endometrial changes, it also helps uh, perhaps in continuation and uh, strong implantation and less rejection of the embryo so that the pregnancy continues. So when do you, where do you get these artificial progesterones? You get it from something called micronized progesterone. You get it from didrogesterone. You get it from uh, all these are um, from plant sources. And uh, this micronized progesterone can be vaginal. It can be a gel. It can be oily. It can be a subcutaneous. And a lot of people or many doctors use different forms. Nowadays, didrogesterone is also used. This one uh, has been known, the intramuscular progesterone has been known to have very high uh, progesterone uh, support to the pregnancy, but it is associated with a lot of pain, a lot of pain. One of the most difficult parts of IVF treatment, which I feel is this injection. So if we can avoid it, why not? Vaginal progesterone is also very good, but it's kind of messy. You're putting it internally. Sometimes a part of it comes out. So all that is going on. Right. So uh, now we come to this paper. But again, before mm -hmm. that, I want to tell you that, which I briefly told in the beginning, that when you are, you've done the IVF cycle, you've taken the eggs, you've taken the embryos, you've made the embryos, you've put it in the lab. Now you've decided that this time, I don't want to transfer. The endometrium is not good, or there's hyperstimulation, or there's fluid in the endometrium, or there's a polyp that's sticking out. For whatever reason, you don't want to transfer, you want to transfer later in a frozen embryo cycle. So you freeze these embryos and then she comes on the next cycle or the next cycle on the first or second day. So you can just follow it and post ovulation. Remember the diagram, we can transfer or you can give some estrogen, some progesterone um, or some ovulation induction agent modified natural cycle. Then you can give uh, hormone replacement, which is uh, just pure estrogens, or you can downregulate and give it in the form of Lupron in the previous cycle from day 21, period comes, and then the estrogens, and then the transfer. Right. Now, what does Dr. Tanja say? What is the study question of this paper? What is the effect of 30 milligram didrogestone given to induce endometrial receptivity in natural proliferative phase FET on ovulation, progesterone, and didrogestone levels and outcomes, right? So that's, uh, that's the, so many questions in it. So what is the effect on the proliferative phase, if you start from here, uh, what happens to, not the secretory phase, okay. Uh, what is its effect on ovulation? What is its effect on the levels? And what is its effect on outcomes? And what is the answer? It allows scheduling endometrial receptivity in natural cycles while not interfering with ovulation. So you've given it when the estrogen reaches the right millimeter, so 7, 7.5, the follicle in a natural cycle, and the follicle is forming. It will continue to form. It will continue to ovulate. You will do your transfer, and your results will not be affected. So what is already known? Globally, 60% of embryo transfers are performed after cryopreservation. That means FETs rather than fresh. FET cycles have come under scrutiny because of risk of insufficient progesterone exposure with conventional dosing 
and maternal fetal stemming from iatrogenic lack of corpus luteum. So some people say, okay, it's great you're getting good results with the frozen embryo transfer, but there is, it's not a natural cycle. What happens in a fresh cycle? There are follicles forming, they are rupturing, they are forming corpus lutea, and then you're transferring. You're mimicking a natural cycle. But in frozen, you're not allowing that corpus luteum. So what is this risk uh, that will happen to the mother or the baby? So then you do a natural cycle. And why do you uh, do a frozen without uh, the corpus luteum when you do the day one, day two? When you start day one, day two estrogens, you have a wide window of implantation. You don't have to pick that specific day. So that is why it is quite popular, though a lot of shifting to natural cycle is happening. So what does this do? Oral dihydrogestone supposedly does not interfere with ovulation and does and corpus luteum formation and does not cross-react with progesterone. It could thus be used for inducing endometrium receptivity in natural cycle and luteal phase support while allowing ovulation disassociated with the window of implantation and monitoring of endogenous. Okay. So maybe this molecule, you started before the ovulation, you perform it embryo transfer after M and this uh, ovulation, and you continue it with the for as a luteal phase support. So it is not affecting your ovulation. It is not affecting your window of implantation. And there is, you know, ease of this frozen embryo transfer. So what is the optimal cycle? When you are monitoring a frozen embryo cycle, what should be the best for the doctor, the best for the patient? And these are, you know, these are live pictures which I've taken from the conference. And, you know, I thought I'll just type it and write it, but I just thought it gives the flavor of, uh, so, you know, uh, please pardon me if they're not appearing uh, exactly like a type PPT, but I thought it's original, so let's just put it here. Right, so these optimal ovulatory protocols, they should have a reliable window of implantation. You have a day three win embryo. You don't want to transfer only on Monday at 10 a.m. and then the window goes. You want to have that flexibility of Monday, Tuesday, maybe even Wednesday, right? The window of implantation should be flexible then it should reliably induce it. That means progesterone changes should happen. It should not interfere with ovulation or corpus luteum formation. We should have no need to measure any hormone levels. It should support the pregnancy through the corpus luteum and the medicine, digestion. It should be injection free. The cost should be low the monitoring should be low, right? These are the features of an optimal cycle. And so here is this, uh, pardon me again, but yeah, it reached seven millimeter, you gave didrogestron and somewhere here you transferred and uh, somewhere here you did the pregnancy test you verified by an ultrasound and you continued the pregnancy and all till the 12th week, you continued. So you're starting didrogestone when it reaches seven to eight millimeters, right through ovulation, right through transfer, right through three months of pregnancy. So, uh, what are the wider implications of these findings? The FET protocol induces the implantation window, offers some flexibility in FET timing, shows little interference with ovulation, provides double support with no need of blood monitoring and good pregnancy rates, injection free and low cost. So this system seems to be great for frozen embryo transfers. Just to recap again, 
induces the implantation window flexibility in ET timing, little interference, double support, no need of monitoring, corpus luteum activity, no new maternal and fetal safety risks, injection free, low cost, right? Excellent. Injection free. Remember the painful natural test injection, didrogestone, 10 milligram TDS. So this is the lovely paper which I heard and I was quite uh, motivated by it to use it on my patients. There's more data coming, a lot of scientific interactions happening. And uh, this is the beautiful city of Amsterdam. And thank you. And this is my picture with Tanja and we had a discussion. And I'm so happy to share my findings, my experiences, the knowledge gained with you. And I hope to see you next time with whatever we learned in this meeting very soon. So please wait for our next exposure to new information. Thank you so much.